this morning. Just keep repeating that name, the name that's above every name, Jesus. Jesus, we love you, Jesus. The holy name of Jesus, we declare that powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. When I was standing during worship this morning, I felt I had a word of knowledge that there's either one or could be several people here that are, are battling where the enemy has continually been bombarding you lately with thoughts that God has taken salvation from you, that he's removed himself from your life, that, he is, that you are no longer saved. And um, all of a sudden I had this like shaking feeling on the inside of me. And I just felt there's some people here that are experiencing that in their life lately. And I want you to know that the devil's a liar. God will never take his salvation from you. It is a free gift. And he will never take it away. No matter what the enemy tries to tell you. The devil cannot take your salvation away. There's nothing that you could do that would cause God to take himself from you. You are in his hands forever. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he, and he will never let you go. And so that God wanted some people to know that this morning, that he will never let you go. That just inward shaking fear. And this song, after we, I had that word of knowledge, we, that song we sang about the, the fear and anxiety and just the name of Jesus, just speaking the name of Jesus that is so powerful in our life. That is our weapon. It's a weapon of war in our life. It's one of our weapons. So I just want to encourage you in that. And um, we have the opportunity this morning to receive communion. We can take that bread out. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, how many know there are two covenants? The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. If you look in your Bible, you have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament. And how many know that there wouldn't have needed to be a new covenant if the old one was good enough, right? It was flawed. There was mistakes. But you know what the flaw was in the old covenant? It was you and me. It wouldn't wouldn't work because it depended upon what we did. Depended on our actions and, and our works and what we did to earn our approval with God. You can sit down for a moment. You have permission now. And so... God declares to Israel, he goes, I'm going to make a new covenant. A new one is coming your way. I will do it. I will write my laws on the tablets of your heart. You will be my people and I will will be your God. And he says, I will do it. And And the new covenant, because of what Jesus did, it no longer depends upon us. It depends completely upon him. And how many know that he can't fail? God don't do wrong, right? And so when we are able to completely rest and depend upon him, we can relax and enjoy the new covenant, the new life that God has for us, to enjoy the blessings of healing, prosperity, health, um, and, and well-being, and all those all kinds of good, the Bible says. And so let's, because of Jesus, receive communion this morning. Can, let's eat together. He says, I will do it. I will do it. It depends completely upon him. There's nothing that you or I could do to make it any better, but there's no way to improve on this new covenant. It is the best, the best. There, there couldn't be any better way. It, it, if I'm removed out of the equation, then I know it's perfect then. <laughs> when you, or I are, you and I are taken out of that, where it's, oh, well, you messed up today, or, oh, you didn't do this sacrifice, or, oh, you had that bad thought, or you said, yelled at your kids, you know, I mean, no one here yells at their kids, I know, and, and, and I know how spouses here never fight, and so I know that, that we're all sitting here perfect, right? <laughs> but because of Holy Spirit, because God put his, he says, I will put my spirit in you. He gives us his grace and his ability to do and to participate in this new covenant. How many are thankful for the blood of Jesus? Because of the blood of Jesus, he will never let you go. He will never, ever, ever let you go, no matter what may come your way, no matter, no matter what happens. We can be secure in that. Let's drink. God, we thank you that this new covenant is not sealed with the blood of lambs. It's not sealed with the blood of goats or, or doves or bulls. God, 
this new covenant was sealed with your own blood, your own sinless, spotless, per perfect life, so that we could become sons and daughters of God. God, today we receive a new level of that sonship and that, that daughtership. And, and as children of God, we come to you, God, as children today to receive all that you have for us. We say, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, we declare your name, Jesus, over every hindrance in life. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, greet those around you. I encourage everyone to come out on a Wednesday night to core night. If you've been coming, I know it's been a blessing to your life. We have classes for all ages of kids. Youth meet at the fitness center every Wednesday night. If you're an adult, we're coming in here, and, I, and um, we have food for everybody. And so you don't have to make supper. Just come here, get ready, and receive from God Wednesday nights. And so tonight, or the, this Wednesday's subject is how to finish strong. Amen. It doesn't matter how you start, but it's how you finish. Amen. All right. If you're dating in this place, isn't that a blessing? <laughs> if you're married in this place, isn't that a blessing? Well, we have a fun night planned. I got, I got my tickets here, and um, it's XOXO Couples Night, and it's going to be a catered meal. There's going to be dancing, fun with your date, and you don't have to be married to come. You can just be a, a dating couple. We want to encourage you to come on out. Um, tickets are, are $20 each, and child care is included. And somebody said, amen. amen. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Someone should run around the room for that. No. <laughs> Child care is included. I mean, that's enough to send you shouting already, isn't it? But um, get your tickets today at the, in the lobby there. There'll be, I think um, Dave will be having them at the table there. So I encourage you, get your ticket. And this happens this Saturday night at 6 p.m., February 11th. Also, ladies, get your tickets for the IF gathering coming up March 3rd and 4th. And also, if you have any questions or need to update your address, sometimes I need someone's address or phone number. I'm like, oh, it's not updated. It's an old number. So I encourage you, uh, please talk to Dave. Update if you have a new address, a new phone number, or something like that. Be sure to connect with us so that we have your correct information. And... Um, if you have any questions about the church or services or anything regarding the church, um, please let Dave know that as well, and he'll be happy to answer your questions. All right? All right. Pastor Steve? God's good. I, I'm going to receive the offering. Sam's going to preach this morning, so I'm going to talk short here. But um, I, I want to, we don't usually say too much about the offering, but um, I'm going to just going to give you a little exhortation. You know, um, there's a lot of debate in the uh, church world about when it comes to finances. And um, I, I saw online uh, several people bring up the idea of, are you a part of the prosperity gospel? How many of you, how many of you have ever seen that? That's kind of, the, there's a big attack on the prosperity gospel. And so, um, well, I'm not a part of the pro poverty gospel. Uh, I can definitely tell you that. Um, but I've realized that there is some, you know, there is some, um, you know, uh, abuses with everything. There's always abuses. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because redemption covers every aspect of our lives. God's interested in your finances. And poverty is not a blessing. You know, my dad um, grew up in extreme poverty. And he didn't want to become a Christian because he had been poor. And the gospel that was being presented that he heard was you have to be poor to be, uh, to be spiritual. And he didn't want to be poor, so he didn't want to be a Christian. And so that was a stumbling block for him for a long time until finally he goes, well, Lord, I'm going to be, if I have to be poor, I'm going to be poor, but I'm going to be a Christian. And then um, he heard a guy preach on the verse that says, I pray above all things thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy soul prospers. And, um, you know, I was listening to a, a guy preach, and he was talking about the verses in 1 Timothy where it says the love of money is the root of all evil. And so and then he kind of read the other verses there, and he stopped short of verse 17 where Paul said, Command those that are rich in this world, be not high minded or trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God, trust in the living God. And listen to this next phrase who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And he gives, he didn't read that verse. And I thought, how, un, how unrighteous uh, is that? 
to stop short of that and leave the impression that, um, you know, all Paul did was warn about money. And uh, money is neutral. It's like sex. Uh, uh, you know, God ordained it. If you do it in the right context, to handle it right, it's godly. It's what God intended. If you take it outside the context that God intended, it's, it can be evil. How many know what I mean? So it didn't say money is evil. It says the love of money. It's your attitude toward it. And you can be as poor as a, you used to say church mice. And I don't like that expression. You, you can be as poor as Bill Gates' dog. And, and still, how do you like that one? But last night I was meditating on this. And, and I, I want to just read a little passage here. Then we're going to receive the offering. But in John chapter 21, after the resurrection of Christ, it said that Peter said to six of the other disciples, I'm going fishing, verse 3, 21, John 21, 3. I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. That's one reason I don't like to fish. <laughs> they caught nothing. Okay. I was going to say something, but. But when morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. I could say something about that, but I won't. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? In other words, you know, we do that when we're out fishing. We see some other boat comes by. We go, you guys catching anything? My dad had an expression. He said, if I catch the one I'm trying for and six, five more, I'll have six. That was his expression. <laughs> Meaning he hadn't caught anything, but... But they didn't know it was Jesus. He said, children, have you any food? They answered, no. And he said, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast, now on the, on, they were not able to cast, so they cast and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fishes. Verse 7, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, he always referred to himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, after they had fished all night and caught nothing, John didn't say, it is the Lord. Let me just say it one more time. After they had fished all night and caught nothing, John didn't say to Peter, hey, this is the Lord. This is the Lord. But when they, when they cast their net on the side of the boat and they caught this innumerable company, 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 numeral net of fishes, John goes, this is God. God was not revealed in the lack or in poverty. God was revealed in the prosperity. And so I just want you to know that it's God's will for us to prosper. And when we give this morning, we need to believe that. We need to believe that God is able to make a way to get increase of finances into our lives so that we can have, be a blessing to give to others. If you have nothing to give, I mean, I've heard people say they gave... Just to give something, they gave a button. Well, thank God for a button, but I'm not really looking for a button this morning. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And actually, you know, the church financially is doing awesome. You guys have been so generous. But I just want you to believe for, a, for a, uh, that, that God, when, when that, all those fish showed up, that abundance, because they were fishermen, abundance of fish meant prosperity to their business. So when that abundance showed up, John said, this is the Lord. Because there's one thing about the Lord. The Lord has a reputation of redeeming situations. The Lord has a reputation of redeeming situations. So you might be in a situation. Let me just tell you this. The Lord has a reputation. And so John said, this is God. This abundance is God. Amen. Amen. So if the ushers could please help me. If you got your, would like to give cash, would like a receipt, just one of you. These, offering, uh, these ushers will give you an offering envelope. Make it out a check. Make it out to Destiny Church. Let's pray over our offering this morning. Lord, thank you that we can give. Thank you, Lord, that you were, you were seen in the abundance. Uh, they didn't say it's the Lord when there was lack. You were seen in the abundance. And Lord, I just pray, God, right now that you would show up and redeem every single person's financial situation here. Lord, as they give in faith, we just believe, Lord, that you are doing something great in their boat. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. As they put their hand to something, Lord, you're doing something great in their boat. And they'll, they'll have an abundance, Lord, to give to every good work. 
I thank you, God, for it now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, men, pass the offering buckets. Let's give Sam a good hand as he comes. Is that this? <laughs> was that somebody else or was this mic? No, is that the microphone? No one heard that, just me? or uh, sounded like a muffler fell off a car or something. It's a diesel engine in the back that runs everything, so that's what it probably was, huh? All right. Well, it's my privilege to give this morning's sermon. And uh, something that God's been talking to me about for a while. And uh, so I've just been something I've been kind of studying and haven't shared any of it. So today you get, uh, you get to hear what I've been digging into a little bit, what God's been personally talking to me about. Who knows that uh, the, two, the three, it's actually kind of like three commandments is love God. I'll just sum, I'll summarize them. Love God, love yourself, and love people. Right? You can't love people without loving yourself. God's standards, you know, the way you treat people, it matters to God. That might be really an obvious statement, but those commandments tell me something. God cares how we treat others. And God's standards are a protection to your heart in your life. Think about it. He's not a mean God who just wants you to follow his rules. He's, he puts rules and, and standards in place so that you are protected, so that people are protected. Do you agree with that? Yeah. All right, so we're on the same page. Your relationships in your life, the experience people are having around you, is from the overflow of your life. Just setting up our message here. So think about that. If you're stressed out, what's the experience people are having around? Stress. If you are peaceful, People feel peace when you're around them. So what I'm saying is, whatever's in your heart, whatever's overflowing from your heart is the experience everyone's having around you. So it is really important that we experience God's love. Because it's impossible to love others if you haven't experienced the God kind of love. When God commands us to love, he doesn't say, a casual love. He's saying agape love people, which is impossible in human effort. So love God, love yourself, and love others with my kind of love. So if you're going to love people with God's kind of love, you have got to get an experience. You've got to get the revelation of how much God loves you. Otherwise, it is impossible to fulfill the command that God's called you to. All that was a big pile of you could ponder that for a while, okay? Not a pile of crap, but good, good stuff, okay? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Big pile of, huh? <laughs> I said that all as a joke. No, I'm kidding. So today I want to talk to you about God's standard for relationship, which is forgiveness. I bet you didn't see that coming, right? But I wanted, you to, I wanted you to set up that it's really important what's in our heart. In November, God began to speak to me, or actually last year, God began to speak to me about forgiveness. And, and then he gave me an opportunity to practice it. Isn't that just like God, right? <laughs> so I had a moment where it was like I felt I got treated unfairly. It was a 10-minute pile of crap, okay? There, 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 there's it is. It was, well, where did that come from? You know, it was one of those. And... I realized I went home and, and, and good for me, or no, lucky for me or blessed for me that God began to talk to me about it because my response in the car when I was driving home was forgive him, bless him. And that's because God was merciful and gracious to me and he's prepared me for the moment. If you could turn with me, to Ephesians 4.30, and actually it'll be on the screen. So this was, this is what, this is how I got into this, and this is, so you understand that this is a, 
something that's been working in my life, and I just want to share it with you. Ephesians 4, 30 through 32, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted. And another translation says affectionate towards forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Good word right there. Um, let me just tell you, let me define these words, because we read those words and we go, yeah, blah, 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 right? Let me, let me read them to you. Bitterness is a root of bitterness, extreme wickedness. Wrath is passion, hard, hard breathing. Anger, heat, boiling up. Anger is violent emotion, impulse, desire, temper. Slander is detraction to another's good's name. Malice is ill will, desire to ignore wickedness, not ashamed to break the law, evil, trouble. So you can actually see there's, a, there's actually a progression in this, in this. Bitterness is a root of bitterness. Okay, so it's a root that starts in your life. And then wrath, you start from that root of bitterness, you, you generally you, you get feelings of anger and you kind of hard breathe and there's, a, there's something that's kind of building. You guys following me? Re anger, then there's a violent emotion that, it, that comes out, right? And then there's slander, then... And then you kind of lash out at people. And this one, I don't know if this one says clamor, but that's like, they have different words in different translations. So that's, and then malice is actual, you're not ashamed to break laws. There's just lashing out and this, just kind of a, you just kind of let yourself go. You guys see that? Okay, and then it says, Instead, one translation, so not this translation, but another one says, but instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, affectionate, forgiving one another as Christ and God forgave you. So it almost gives you an option. It's like you can have one or the other in your life. And I, one, I think this is a good way to look at it is if you can see two rivers flowing into your life, one is... The Holy Spirit, it's life, it's good things, it's tenderhearted, it's, that, it's the love from God. Then there's another river that runs, and it's bitterness, wrath, anger, slander, malice, it's unforgiveness. And in between those two rivers, there's, there's a door. And you can either swing that door shut on bitterness and all these things, or you can open the door, you can swing the door shut on the, on the life of God in your life. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit into your life. And I'd say you can also, so the, the reason I get to this point is because it says instead. So you can, you can kind of pick. Or you can probably just leave the door like this and you can just have both rivers flow into your life. But who knows that the murky water is going to contaminate the good water. So I think a lot of us... When we get into this, it's, it's probably a little bit of both. We probably have a little bit. It's not that we're totally dead to God or there's no life, but it's like it's kind of murky. It's missing the power. It's missing something. It's like the waters have been gotten dirty. Who knows what I'm saying? And just remember... God doesn't say this because he wants you to follow his rules. God says this to protect you, to protect those around you. Let me ask you this. What are the expressions that we should expect if the Holy Spirit's flowing in our life? If we're experiencing the life of God. So if we've shut the door on malice, all these different things, what is the experience and the expression that the power of the Holy Spirit should be in our life? Do you think that we should see an expression from the Holy Spirit in our life? The Bible says that this is the kingdom of God. It's not eating or drinking. It is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It also says in Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of life in us, this kind of fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self gentleness, self-control. Against There is no such thing, no law against these things. <clears throat> I 
So I say all this to say, what is the fruit in your life? Can you see the fruit of these things working in your life? And I believe that God has given us this great tool, forgiveness. Forgiveness. And if we don't use the tool of forgiveness, then we will have the things listed in that verse working in our life. Here's another option that I think that happens. And God started speaking to me about. Is that when we get hurt in relationships, one of the things that I think Christians, nah, I won't say Christians, I think people do, is that we start to shut down part of us. Here, this is how it goes. You get hurt by somebody, you start feeling wrath, anger, you get those things and you go, I can't control the anger towards that person. I think I'll just shut it down instead of heal up. Instead of forgive them because they don't deserve it, I'm just going to hold the bitterness and I'm just going to kind of shut that down because I, because I get so angry when I think about it. And I lash out, I, I treat my wife differently, I treat my kids differently. Maybe I should just shut it down. I deaden myself in that area because I don't want to feel the pain from that experience. You know what the answer to it is? Forgiveness. God has given us a powerful tool. It's called forgiveness. So that's why I say again, should you be seeing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control in your life? And the answer is yes, you should. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, there should be fruit that comes from you. But the problem is you might have shut yourself down in an area of your life. God can't use a place where you've shut down. If you shut your heart towards people, you shut your heart down towards everybody. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you deaden yourself, you, you're a robot. You're a robot. I can't party. I can't cry. I don't do nothing. You can say something mean to me, it just bounces off because I don't feel anything anyways. It's like, that's not, that's not good. The Bible says a tender heart. Be affectionate. Be kind to one another. There should be an experience of life coming from you. I feel like this is an area where we are missing the power of God because we've shut down the power of God in our life. I mean this very sincerely. Here's another verse. So, so, and, the, and this starts out by saying, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, but abandon these things. Get rid of these out of your life. But, because what? It limits the Holy Spirit in your life. These things limit God. Again, we go back to forgiveness. Here's another verse that talks about this. It's in 1 Peter 2. I don't think I put this on the, ver on the screen. Maybe I didn't. But 1 Peter 2, 1 through 4. Abandon all these forms of evil, hypocrisy, feelings of jealous and, sl and slander. In the same way that nursing infants cry for milk, you must crave the pure spiritual milk. Again, who knows that the Bible talks about the four conditions of a heart. We won't read that verse, but there's four conditions of a heart. And there's, there's things, there's weeds that can get in our heart that choke out, what? The word of God in our life. See, the word of God is what purifies you, it what grows you. If you're stuck, there's a good chance that it's because of how you've dealt with people in your life. And the word of God is being choked out so you can't grow. The, the word of God is what grows you as a Christian. If you're stuck in your Christianity, there's a good chance it's because how you treated people. Here's a great picture. I'm not saying God did it because of this, but the cross is vertical, but it's also horizontal. Right? You don't, you can't, the moment you, if you want to deal with God completely, you also have to deal with people. If you go live on a mountain and say, me and God are going to spend the rest of my life together, you're going to be a weird, non-growth person. You're going to be like, you're, this is growing, or there's going to be a weird growth on your body, Okay? You can't do that. God requires us to treat people a certain way. Love God, love yourself, and love others is the command. I'm letting that soak in for a moment. Doesn't that suck sometimes? No, I mean it. It's not easy. And let me just say something, because right now people are going, yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. And they, you don't, you don't get it. 
And let me just tell you this. I don't. I don't understand it fully. But Jesus didn't do this. Jesus did not submit to abuse from people. Jesus would slip away when they were going to try to kill him, right? He submitted to the abuse only when one thing happened, when it was the time for him to submit to the abuse. God said, all right, this is the moment. This is why you're on this earth. This is the purpose for why I put you on this earth, right? Then Jesus submitted to the abuse. So this does not mean that you have to let crazy people into your life. It really does not mean that. We call it boundaries, right? Boundaries. But the Bible doesn't say boundaries necessarily that I've seen. But the point is that when I look at Jesus' life, Jesus didn't, wasn't pushed around by people. People would come to him and say, Jesus, please come right now. And he would stay there for two days and go, yeah, I'll, I'll come when the time is right. He wasn't pushed around by people. He wasn't abused by people until it was in God's will. So be really clear that what I'm saying to you is, is not go spend a bunch of time with crazy people because that's good for you. Okay? I mean that. But we know that we live with people in our home. They're going to hurt us. And we have to deal with this pain in our life. Otherwise, we become dead and just shells of human beings because we're shutting down parts of our life. I can't handle the pain. And I get that. But God has given us a powerful tool. So in Ephesians 3.32, I'm going to get into a couple practical steps about forgiveness. And this is what worked for me and some of the things that I've seen in the Bible. And I just want to share them with you. You guys all ready for these? Okay. So remember, be doers of the word, not hearers only. So I believe when you leave today and be examining your heart that, okay, God, where, where have I held unforgiveness in my life? So the Bible says in Ephesians 3.32, even, this is the end of the verse, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So how are you supposed to forgive people? Just like Christ forgave you. Just the way God did it. That's how you're supposed to forgive. So the standard's pretty high, people. What did he do with your sins? Oh, man, he wiped them away. He released you. He said, you're released. I pardon you. Holy smokes, that's a high standard, is it not? Not only that, did he do that, then he did a bunch of good things for you. He didn't just put you on playing like right here. No, he, he put you... He said, you're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing. We can't talk about that today. But that's why at this church we talk so much about what God's done for us because that is, you need that in your life so you can love people. So it's really important. But how has God really? Okay, God has given us. He's, there's no penalty. He's released us. So let's turn to Matthew 8, 21 through 35. How's everybody doing? You guys all okay? I know this, this could be a heavy message for some people, and um, but... We'll be around to talk if it, if it feels like, wow, that, that was a blow. I'll, I'll talk to you, all right? But let's, let's read in um, Matthew 18, 21. And Peter came to him and asked the Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, se- no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, you guys ready? I'm going to read this parable to you. Read it with me there. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought to him who owed millions of dollars. One, one translation said uh, bil- a billion dollars. Uh, it's just, it was a large sum of money back then that it was basically your lifetime of work. Impossible. That's basically what it comes down to. He couldn't pay, so the master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and children and everything he owned to the debt, to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But then the man left the king. He went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. So not, you know, just, just a little bit compared to what he owed. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some other servants saw this, they were very upset. And they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. When the king 
called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you a tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, somebody might say, well, that's God sending you to hell then because you didn't forgive. I don't think so. I think actually you, who, who's, who's in control of if God's going to forgive, if that, that person gets um, forgiven or not? He was in control of it. He says, you are going to be tortured until you can pay the debt. So I don't think, I think what happens is when we hold unforgiveness towards a brother or a sister, anybody in our life, I think that you put yourself into torture. I think you, you cut off the power of God into your life. You cut off the power of the Holy Spirit. You cut off the power of the Word into your life. It begins to choke the Word of God into your life, and now you're, you're stuck. And now what you're, what you're stuck with is bitterness, wrath, and, and now you just have the fruit in your life will be evil. It will just be bad. So here's three things. Everyone say three things. Three things that God's called us to do with forgiveness. And he shows us. The first one is forgive passionately. He said, shouldn't you have had mercy? In another translation, shouldn't you have had compassion on your brother or sister like I had compassion on you? Shouldn't you have compassion, an open heart, a tender heart? Shouldn't you be kind like I was kind to you? God requires that we have compassion when we forgive. Here's what compassion looks like. Or compassion is to suffer together. The feeling that arises when you are confronted with another's suffering and feel motivated and relieve that suffering. Here's a couple examples of compassion in the Bible. Jesus had compassion on people and he moved to heal them when he, with compassion. And then the story of the Samaritan. Remember, he saw that person on the side and it says he had compassion on that person who was beaten. And then what did he do? He put him on his donkey. He brought him. He bandaged him. He said, I'm going to pay for him. I'll come back and, and cover the bill. Right? He paid, gave money and then he said, I'll come back. And that is when he, God says, have compassion He's saying, consider the other person's situation. Have an open heart. Even, even though they hurt you, consider their situation when you forgive. I know that, that's, a, that's a tough one, right? You need, you need some God help there. When some, if you've actually been hurting by somebody, it is hard to have compassion on their situation. But this is what God asks us to do. Okay, so compassionately. We forgive compassionately. The second thing is forgive quickly. Quickly. You know why God says that? Because if that sits in there and stirs in your heart, you become a bitter old person. You become stinky. Your attitude sinks. You're hard to be around. And everybody gets around you. They feel it. God's saying, don't let that sit in your heart very long. Deal with it immediately. Here's two examples in the Bible. Jesus, this, this story is amazing to me. I, I never, I've never heard this before, but Luke 23, 34, it says that Jesus said, for, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, and they divided his garments. Now this verse, if you could look at the subtitle, you know, and they always put that little letter, was that subtitles or something like that? Subtext. It says, this isn't in all the, this isn't, this is only found in Luke. And the, the, they said, this verse isn't really here. They didn't know where to put it. And one of them, and it says, because he kept saying it. So they didn't know where to put it. In other words, when they laid him on the cross, he said, forgive them, Father. When they were driving the nails in this hand, 
He said, Father, forgive them. He, they don't know what they do. When they did it over here, he said, Father, forgive them what they do. When they mocked him, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And I'm sure when they were whipping him, he was doing the same thing. Why, why would Jesus do that? Because he would not let bitterness and those things get in his heart. He said, I can't have that in my heart. I have to forgive quickly. I can't let a root of bitterness get into my heart. So each soldier that pounded that nail, he said, forgive him. He released forgiveness quickly. And the example here, I thought that was interesting. They didn't know where to put it because he said it so many times. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? Acts 7.54, and, and, and then it shows it later in the church that that was a practice that they made in the church. It says the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. Do you guys remember Stephen's message? You guys ever read the Stephen's sermon that he gave to the leaders? It's awesome. He goes on this like, nice little story, and then he goes, and then you. And then he turns around, and they're like, we're going to kill you. We thought it was a nice story. No, it was about you. And they were infuriated. And this is what happened. They shook their fists at him in rage. This is uh, the NLT version. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily in heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Um, or look, I saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Yes, I said it right. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid it at the feet of the a man named Saul, and as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling on his knees, he said, don't charge them with these sins. Forgive them. Can you imagine someone throwing a stone at your face, trying to kill you, a bunch of them, and you, you saying, God, don't hold this sin against them. <laughs> I'm thinking, God, get them. Get them, God. They shouldn't be doing this to me. He goes, do not hold this sin against him. Where did he get that? He got it from his Savior, Jesus, the one he followed, the one he lived his whole life for. He goes, this is what Jesus did. This is what I'm going to do. Don't hold this sin against them. I don't even know how you'd get there when people are throwing rocks at you. But quickly, he was not going to die with unforgiveness in his heart. He goes, I, I'm going to deal with this right now. And the last one is, so compassionately, so keep, keep your heart pure and tender, compassionate. Again, doesn't mean you have to have them in your life. I'm not saying that. But don't let your heart close. Don't shut your heart. That's only going to hurt you. Forgive quickly, just like our Savior forgave. And the last one is unlimited Unlimited, which we read, should I forgive seven times? Jesus pushes to the, he says a very exaggerated statement here. He says it's so exaggerated. He goes, he doesn't say, no, just, no, you just got to just keep forgiving. He, he's like, no, Peter, not seven times, 70. And he, when you're saying 70, you're thinking, well, 70? And they go, 70 times seven. And you're like, what? Are you crazy? I'm supposed to keep forgiving the person? It's, he's exaggerating. It's unlimited. And actually, there's, I, I read someone who had dug into that, and they said, that's supposed to be daily. So that's, I did the math on it. It's about three minutes, just under three minutes. Every three minutes, you'd have to, in a 24-hour period. That means they'd be, you'd be up, you know, through the whole day. And so what am I saying? I mean, no one's, that's not going to actually happen, right? Maybe in, if you're in a prison getting beaten, maybe, but... Um, so it would be rare. But what Jesus is saying is don't keep unforgiveness in your heart. Keep releasing forgiveness. Keep releasing forgiveness. Don't stop. He exaggerated the point. So here, I've, I've had a, here, here's my own story, and I'll end with this, is that I've done it right and I've done it wrong. This last time, this last year, I did it right. The moment I got in that car, I, I, I was studying on it, and I thought, 
I know exactly what to do. I have to forgive quickly. And, and this is the key to, for me that, that really cleans my heart. And that's in Matthew 5, 43. It says, your, answers have taught, your ancestors have taught, uh, sorry, your ancestors have also been taught, love your neighbors and hate the one who hates you. However, I say, love your enemies, bless the one who curses you, do something wonderful for the one who hates you, and respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. And that was the verse that popped up for me, and I immediately started praying for the person. Praying for someone reveals your heart towards them very quickly. It does. It's, like, it's shocking that if you go, do I have an angst towards that person? I don't know. Pray for him once. <laughs> it is so amazing how that is a revealer of your heart. If you cannot pray for the person, bless them and say, God, I want so much. And you, you could list the goodness that you want for them. If you can't do that, there's a good chance you got something. But it also is the thing it's like a blockade towards unforgiveness, bitterness into your heart. The first thing to do is what Jesus and them did. Forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. Which is really tough to say when someone does you wrong. You kind of want to go, God, hold it against them. I don't want the unforgiveness, but you, know, you should probably deal with them. That's kind of what you want to say. But what I found is that praying for them is not only just a way to blockade in that moment, but it's also a way to get unforgiveness out of your heart. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it, 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 um, it cleaned my heart out, I'll just put it that way. I had, a, I had a season where I let unforgiveness get in my heart, and, and it was affecting my, my joy, it was affecting my peace, you know, it, it, have you ever been there? I don't know if you have, but where it consumes your mind. And my prayer, my prayer started like this, because the Lord spoke to me and said, it, this verse came to mind, so I started, I, I, so this is a different situation. You guys got that? This is a different situation. And I, and I, my prayers would start like this. Lord, I just, for, I just play, pray for them, bless them. That's how the prayer started. That was a week of praying like that. The second week, Lord, yep, bless them. A little louder. Maybe a month I was going, Lord, yep, uh, just bless them. But I felt nothing. So in other words, I didn't have a tender, open heart yet. My, I had no compassion. And then two months into it, I started to feel it a little bit. Meaning, I actually meant it. And I couldn't believe I actually meant it. Can you believe it? My, my, the root of bitterness was starting to be pulled from my heart. And then three months to it, at one point, I was crying in the car while I prayed it because I meant it so much. And I thought, it's these, what is this wetness under my eyes? I'm a man. No, I'm just kidding. But it's like, what I'm saying is, there was actual affection. The command that God said, love them with an open heart, with a tender heart. I could say, I'm actually doing it now. Why? Well, I forgave, but I, but I also daily practiced what I, what I was believing for, right? And actually prayer cleansed my heart. And so what I'm going to say to you is, and I, I heard the, someone the other day say, I didn't know it, but for 40 years I've held unforgiveness in my heart towards my parents or for, towards that person. And I didn't know it was there. But it was affecting my relationship with God. So unforgiveness can be a sneaky thing. But like I'm saying, prayer reveals your heart. So you go, no, do I have unforgiveness towards my parents? Just pray for them. Start praying right now. Start praying for them. If you can go, God, I don't know, get them, God. <laughs> if there's that, then you go, oh, we got a problem here. <laughs> if you're praying and you kind of, you know, it's like your heart's not really in it, but you say the prayer and you're like, yeah, but I don't really mean it that much. There's something there. Forgive them. Release them. So I'm just going to go over the, la the few things here is forgive compassionately, unlimitedly. What's the other one? Quickly, thank you. Quickly. Forgive these ways. And I, the key for me was prayer. 
to bless those, like Jesus said, bless those and pray for those. Let, let, me, let me tell you one last thing about it. This, was, this is pretty awesome. Think about two chapters later, after Stephen forgave Saul, what did God do to Saul? He kicked him off his horse. His high, prideful horse. And he said, I'm going to use you. The thing that you tried to destroy, you're going to be the face of it now. You are going to work for me. And I believe that Stephen releasing him to God, releasing the unforgiveness and going, don't hold this against him. God said, I'm not. I'm going to forgive him, and I'm going to use him for my glory. And, you know, Jesus said in, um, in uh, I don't remember if it was in Luke or John, but he, he, it says, oh, here it is, John 20. J Jesus said to his disciples, this is after he rose from the, rose, rose from the dead, he said, I think, it, I think it's after he rose from the dead, but he said, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Wow. He told his disciples that. He said, Receive the Holy Spirit, and this is what you're supposed to do. Forgive sins, and they'll be forgiven. So there's a response that God has that actually when we forgive people, their sins. There's a, an authority that believers carry, and I don't fully understand that. But maybe you can dig into that. But I believe that God actually responds to what, when we forgive people. It's like, God, you handle this. You take care of this. You take revenge if you take revenge, or you forgive, or you deal with this situation. I'm not taking revenge. I'm not going to deal with this. This is yours now. Amen. Amen. Could you stand with me? And could we have the worship team come forward? Thank you, Lord. Do we have a song for us here? Okay. You know, I think, um, I think the action here is, I, I tried to make it pretty simple that when you leave, you know what to do. But can we just, can we bow our heads right now? Because what I think is that God doesn't want you to have unforgiveness in your heart because it's holding you back from him. It's holding you back from your destiny. So if it's in there, it needs to get out. So I just want us to, can we just bow our heads and just, your own way, your own time, could you just take a moment and ask God, God, if there's any unforgiveness, just privately, you just ask God, reveal it to me, Holy Spirit. You don't have to go on a, a sin search in your life here. The Holy Spirit will help you with this. The Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us, help us, reveal this to us, that we could be set free, that we could be your free sons and daughters, that we would not be in bondage to bitterness, to unforgiveness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for help on this. Let's sing this song together. Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Let's sing that again. Here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room. Thank you. 
Jesus. God, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit working in every heart and every life. God, I thank you your presence reveals areas in our hearts, God, that, that you'd like to improve, areas you'd like to bring your glory into. And God, we thank you in Jesus' name that the power of the Holy Spirit is here. God, to bring us to a higher way of living, a, a new way of life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If there's um, we have prayer, prayer, um, prayer team members. If you guys could make your way to the front. If you're struggling in the area of forgiveness and you'd like us to agree with you in prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If you have a, a physical need, if you feel tormented in any way, mentally, you fi- um, you're, you're, if you're sick, I encourage you to come down and, and to the front and we'd love to pray with you as we dismiss. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you that this will be a house filled with your glory. God, there's no room for flesh, God, in your, in your, in your glory and in your presence. And God, we just declare purity of heart in this place in Jesus' name. Purity of, purity of heart and mind. As Sam was speaking, maybe you, uh, there were specific instances or maybe people, someone's face flashed before your, your, your mind. I encourage you, allow the Holy Spirit to work in those areas. He wants His glory to be seen in your life in every single area. Thank you, Jesus. 
So I encourage you to come forward if you'd like prayer. Um, as we dismiss, we do have refreshments in the dining room. And if you have any questions about the service or anything, please talk to Dave. And we just ask parents, please remember to go get your children immediately, just honoring the time of, of those children's volunteers. Thank you so much and have a blessed week.